Hello, this is Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network every Thursday at 1 p.m. And you could also find me on the Conscious Resistance YouTube channel and uh, Conscious Resistance website, as well as uh, find my work on the Seeds of Liberty podcast. So today we have um, Caleb Bader, who's a voluntarist and is the ex, he's an ex Voluntary Virtues Network show host. Uh, his show was called Journey of the Unshackled Mind, which was put on a uh, temporary hiatus for um, unknown reasons. <laughs> so, um, so Caleb, um, tell us a little bit about, because you're, um, you're ex-military, right? Um, you're a veteran, so, so why don't you um, explain you know, your, uh, your background in the military and your experience and how that led you down the path of volunteerism? Yeah, and basically that's that's what it was that led me down the path to volunteerism was that experience. I think that, that you know, growing up, I always had kind of a, the heart of an anarchist without the philosophy. You know, I, I think that because I, I was always questioning authority and why why do we do things this way? Why why are questioning tradition, questioning everything? But you know. There's some things that are so ingrained in our society, like the state, where you, a lot of people, you just don't think about them for a long time. It's just a fact of life, is what it seems like. Um, so I, I never really considered the idea of living without a state. Um, I never considered the idea of not needing a national defense or anything like that. Um, so basically what led me to join the Marine Corps was September 11th. The events of September 11th, 2001 really affected me. Um, that was several years before I joined the Marine Corps, but that was the time I remember when I decided this is what I'm going to do. This is the path that I'm going to take. And from then on, I was, I was sort of uh, training myself for that. And I would, you know, study up on the Marine Corps, everything about them, you know, I, I was learning drill movements and stuff like that, you know, which later on when I became a Marine, I was kind of embarrassed of, you know, <laughs> doing that, was, oh man, that was ridiculous to, to do as a kid, but I, I did that stuff, and I even, I was part of a, a youth group called the Young Marines, which is like a ROTC type group, and uh, <laughs> that that's something. If you want, we could we could go in and talk about that a little bit too. Is uh, looking back on that, you know, at the time it was it was a good time for us, and uh, we we enjoyed the things that we did and everything like that. My brother, my brother hated it. He thought it was stupid, you know, to spend this free time just getting yelled at and told what to do and stuff like that. But some of us ate it up, and it was because of this. Uh, this culture that we have where we we look to military members soldiers and marines and these uh, you know kids especially boys are brought up to look at them as heroes you know as kids i don't know if it was the same for you but i, I would get out my little you know gi joes and army men and everything like that and play with them have little battles and you know go crazy with it doing it Looking back on it, things that were, man, that was sick that I did that as a kid. I would take like a little army man and take a lighter and melt him a little bit. And like, oh, he's, you know, and that would be part of my big scenario. And like, do all this. And looking back on it, I'm like, man, that, but that's, that's the culture. Mm -hmm. That's because that's heroic, you know. Now, I think really that, that I'm kind of getting into a digression here, but. That's all right. No problem. <laughs> I think that's really one of the the main problems at, as pertaining to military service of the state is th that's perpetuated this whole hero mythology this oh you're you're a legend you're a part of this great brotherhood you're fighting for freedom and there's this this glory in it and you know kids look up to that like, you know, I want to. I want to do that with my life. 
<sighs> yeah. Yeah. Where, I mean, really, when you look at the facts, I, I mean, don't get me wrong. There's a certain amount of courage that goes into certain situations relating to combat. But that's not, that's not heroism. That's, maybe, there's, maybe there's certain situations where a, a, a person could be called a hero because they, they were brave under fire and they saved lives or, or whatever. You know, I, I'm, I'm sure there are cases of that. But this idea that anyone who puts on a uniform, who signs, you know, the dotted line and says that, you know, I'm a Marine now, they're a hero just because they put on that uniform. That, there's, there's something twisted about that because you're not anymore looking at that individual and what that individual does. You're looking at this, well, he's part of this thing, so he's automatically a hero. And, and really, it doesn't, it, it doesn't make any sense. There's no reasoning to it. And when you look at the facts that, you know, people like to bring up all this, oh, well, you know, it's, they're out there doing one, one of the most dangerous jobs to protect us. And you, well, no, it's not one of the most dangerous jobs. It's, I mean, sure, yeah, there's danger. Like, I can tell you firsthand, there's definitely danger. And there was many times where, you know, I could have died or people around me could have died or did die. But statistically, it's still not one of the most dangerous jobs. What I do right now as a construction worker is a more dangerous job statistically <laughs> than what I did then as a Marine. It's, it's more dangerous. It's also more productive for society. It's also healthy for the economy. <laughs> Wait, you're saying murder is so, not healthy for the economy? What? Wait. <laughs> I, so, no, it, it's... And isn't it crazy how many people actually believe that? And that's what also before we started recording, we were talking about, about economics and you know, most people just not knowing anything about economics. How many people actually believe that war is healthy for the economy? People would tell me that all the time. Even as when I was transitioning, about to get out of the Marine Corps, and I was, I was in the transition stage, I was either a volunteerist or about to be, you know, I was libertarian stage, you know, Ron Paul supporter or whatever. And I was going, I would, I would talk to people around base and talk to my friends and stuff, talking about these ideas and about the wars and about the government, all, the, all this stuff. And I would even get them down to the point where they would, they would be agreeing with me on everything, everything. And in the end, it all comes back to, well, you know, if, if, if we hadn't have been for World War II, we wouldn't have got out of the Great Depression. <laughs> and that, man... Because there's always there's always something that uh, it's so deeply ingrained that there has to be a state, and until somebody is kind of jostled out of that or freed from that, um, they're, they're always going to be trying to think of excuses. But yeah, indeed. So I, I got way off track with it. What was the initial? <laughs> no problem. Well, <laughs> well, I was I was also curious as to. Um, while you were in the Marines, like what, what um, got you thinking about, um, you know, that this might be wrong, that I might not be on the good guy side? <laughs> like what, what got you thinking like that? Well, it was just common sense, looking around and applying, applying that situation to my life. What, what would I think if this was? where I live, what if what if this was Wichita, Kansas, yeah. and there's all these guys in uniforms rolling around on trucks speaking a different language than me, they got these big trunks with machine guns on them, I drive down the road, and they're pointing their machine guns at me and my family, and they're stopping us randomly and pulling us out of the car and searching us, disrespecting me in front of my children, and, you know, putting guns in my kids' faces, and, and uh, shooting civilians, and, you know, doing... It's... You just start looking around. That's that's all it takes, and that's why, you know, I'm, I'm blown away, you know, because there's there's a lot of people that I truly believe are good people, 
but they keep doing that. They they stick with it. No, they do a whole career. And but I I wondered, you know, because I, I know there's smart people, there's good people, and what? How how do they not see the same things out of that? Or there must be there's something. There's always something convincing them that's necessary. Um, which I think is what's important with like the work that you're doing with Voluntary Virtues Network and with the Seeds of Liberty podcast. Um, because you're just putting those ideas out there that they get people thinking that there is an alternative. Yeah, yeah. Isn't it really amazing how we have to actually say murder is not good for the economy? <laughs> like, we actually have to say that, you know, because, um, you know, it's like, it's like, uh, you know, if destruction was good for the economy, then, you know, why don't we just destroy our own factories? Why don't we destroy our own houses? <laughs> why don't we, you know, pillage, you know, stores in your local town? Like, wouldn't that stimulate the economy, <laughs> right? Along, along the twisted Keynesian logic. But uh, that's, that's the exact... Um, garbage that we are all fed in our government schools that are that are um, coincidentally funded by <coughs> government stolen funds <laughs> right yep that's that's all it is yeah that's all it is. i mean i mean uh, going through so so going through high school um so like did you basically um, like just believe everything that you were taught in high school. Did you, question, did you did you question any of it? No, I, I questioned all of it. Oh yeah, that, that's that's the crazy thing to me too. That I I would I there's something I thought about quite a bit after I, you know, just kind of discovered volunteerism and just libertarian theory and just this whole new way of looking at things. Yeah, uh, I I looked back on those times and man, how did I not come to this sooner? Because that that's my whole life. That's how I've been. Is is questioning, um, and that I was no fan of the government ever. Uh, is is another funny thing. I, I I didn't like the government anything about, it, but I I for some reason I disassociated the military and the government. You know, wow. to me the you know the military. Well, because it's easy to, to the, there's a difference between the IRS and the, you know, the DMV and the cops and and the military, you know. But now, with the deeper philosophical understanding, I realize, you know, there's not much of a difference in the end. But, you know, I, growing up, I'm dealing with the cops. I'm dealing with, you know, people got to pay taxes and pay tickets and just I could tell you know that oh, that's just extortion you know I already knew that yeah before but so no I, I definitely didn't just accept everything and I I did go to a public school and I I think I went to a pretty good public school actually uh, I went to a, a small town public school and ha I did have some some good teachers mm -hmm. um, I'm not you know I've got Obviously, problems with the public school system, <laughs> but uh, I I did go to a pretty a pretty good school. Where people care about you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it all starts with the um, you know with the children because if you can get the children thinking about and believing this propaganda, then you know you've got pretty obedient, um, steady tax cattle, right? <laughs> <laughs> that, yeah. will, that will go along with any law, with any taxation, any regulation, happily, because the government is always in their favor. The government is always looking out for the little guy. The, the government's always watching your freedom, right? The government's protecting you right? <laughs> from, the, from the foreign boogeymen who seem to pop up every single year like clockwork. <laughs> it's, always, uh, it's always a different boogeyman, right? <laughs> I probably would have been an anarchist sooner if in my government class they taught anarchism. As well as all the other forms of government, <laughs> right? <laughs> so and, uh, if they taught if they taught Austrian economics in high school, you know. <laughs> yeah, right. So, so what um, what books really um, 
affected you and influenced you, your line of thinking? Well, it's, it's kind of crazy, too, that some of the books that really influenced me were books that I read previously to being a voluntarist that I read back in high school or middle school, even uh, like 1984 by George Orwell and, uh, and Thoreau. I, I was a big fan of Thoreau's work all, you know, since I was young. And uh, so that, those were a couple that really influenced me and, and still do. Um, I, I would look back as I was kind of in my transition period while I was still in the Marine Corps and I would just, I would see all these things that I related to when I read about them in 1984. And I would just think about those things. Like when I was going through boot camp, uh, we had these, and this was definitely before that transition period, <laughs> but this was definitely when I was full, full blown, I'm a Marine, let's do this. But we, we had this time in boot camp where we would have all this rigorous training. We, we wouldn't be able to, you know, we obviously, obviously didn't have any connection to the outside world. We couldn't watch any videos or anything like that, except the only time we got to watch any videos or listen to any kind of music was they would do these things called moto videos where you'd be in class and they're trying to keep everybody awake and get everybody motivated again. So they play on the big screen in the class in front of everybody, they play uh, these just video video clips of firefights and you know people getting killed, and you just play to like music and stuff. You know, music we like, you know, that we we know and we we're, we're thinking about that good music we've been missing out on and just while having a good time, you know, watching these these videos of people getting killed, and that, you know, I. I got into you know I got into that and stuff and then I, I don't remember when it was but one of those times I was like I don't remember this is like the the what is it the the three minutes hate in 1984 mm -hmm. where they all sit they all sit this part of their day they all sit in front of the TV screen and they just get all this mass hysteria yeah. and hate built up and this they're this unthinking mass of hate. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking that even that far back, even while I was still, you know, all about it, I remember having those kinds of thoughts back to, well, those writers that influenced me. Mm -hmm. So I, obviously that shows that even if it's subtle, even if it's a small little difference that a writer makes, and I mean, that's still an influence that they had. Mm -hmm. But, I, you know, I, I would think the same thing as I was in the transition period, as I was starting to, uh, to uh, research the background of the area that I was in in Afghanistan and uh, research foreign policy in that area over the past few decades, you know, and, and really realize what, what was going on. I, I would think back to 1984 again about this whole, this whole, uh, oh, we've always been at war with Eurasia. <laughs> or we've always been at war, you know, because that's how it was. Yeah. I, I looked back and I said, well, hold a minute, hold on a minute. So you, Osama bin Laden's a CIA asset. It, Osama bin Laden worked with the U.S. government, and they were calling they were calling him heroes and freedom fighters just a couple years before I was born. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. When I was a baby, uh, Murray Rothbard uh, definitely influenced me a lot at the very beginning. He's one of the first uh, people writers that I got turned on to. Which um, which books of his? The uh, Anatomy of the State was the first one that I read, and obviously that's just a real little simple book, but it's so power-packed and it lays everything out so clear and concise that that, that was, I think I actually mentioned this in, in one of my videos when I was still doing the show, is that was when I realized I finished reading that book and I was like, okay, I'm an anarchist, <laughs> like that's it, mm -hmm. and because I was still on that teetering point of, you know, I had just finished with my whole... Um, Ron Paul for president, you know, type of, um, it was in, in that, that time frame where I was, I was still, I, I was a minarchist. I considered myself a minarchist, um, libertarian. So that kind of pushed me over that teetering point. Mm -hmm. Um, so 
So. Yeah. And and if you were to talk to a Marine now, what, what would you tell him? Or, or just anyone in the military? <laughs> I mean, I got, you know, that would, that would just depend on the situation, I guess. I, I don't know. I guess relating to, man, you just got to, that's a, that's a question. <laughs> <laughs> do you, or, or do you still talk yeah. to like some of the people that you were, that you went, that you were uh, I do. in the military? I do. I'm still good friends with a few of them. Not, not very many, but I'm st- still good friends with a few. And so they're definitely that? friendships that I value. And there's still a couple of them that are actually still in the Marine Corps and probably will be for a long time. Um, but they're still good friends of mine, and I still talk to them. And um, I, we, I think that we, even with the understanding that we have and the views that we have, um, I'm not one to shut people out because they're agents of the state, and. Uh, I'm not willing to shut people out because they're, they just believe in statist ideology either. Um, it's Some people do. Some people take it to that level. I don't think that we're at the point yet where it's, it's practical or it's right to do that. Um, now, if I had a friend that was just outright hateful that was in the Marine Corps. Like, I knew some of these type of guys that would just talk about, oh, man, all I want to do is kill ragheads, well, you know. Um, that's somebody that I would probably disassociate with. But if I have a friend that's in the Marine Corps that, that really truly believes that they're defending the country, they're defending their family, they're, they're doing something good, you know, I... I and and they're not they're not hateful and you know I I don't think that it's it's right in in my position to disassociate with them especially when I I've been in that position you know some people it takes longer than others too you know Major General Smedley Butler he served what thirty years in the Marine Corps I don't I don't know exactly how long he served in the Marine Corps but before he came to the cl- conclusion, you know, it took him several wars, several, you know, and then he comes out with wars of racket. Mm-hmm. So it takes some people longer than it takes others to, to realize that wars of racket. Um, so um, w- one thing that, that came to mind was um, the, uh, the saying, it was one of my favorite sayings is, uh, the, the road to hell is paved with paved with good intentions, right? Yeah. So, so you know, a politician who says, you know, um, we're going to, um, you know, raise the minimum wage to, you know, to help the little guy. Um, I mean, if he has good intentions and he really truly believes that's going to help the little guy, does it really matter if, in the end, his good intentions end up hurting? most of you know the uh lesser skilled inexperienced young people um so so my question is um that like you said you know there are some people that are like really um you know they uh they're just angry and hostile and they just want to kill people and then some people are are good people right but but perhaps then i mean it seems to me that those people it's easier for, to talk to them Right. And to get them to understand that, you know, um, since they're not doing it out of hostility, they're, they're, they think they're really doing good. So then maybe you can take that and just say, you know what, actually, <laughs> even by you not actually killing somebody, you're still, you know, contributing to theft and system and institutionalized violence and coercion and things like that just by you being in the military. Have you have you ever mention like that to your friends or to anybody who's who's not hostile oh yeah no i no. I, even people that are hostile i've mentioned that to you know everybody knows i, I think everybody 
that knows me knows where I stand okay. on that. They know that I'm not a troop supporter. I don't support the troops. Okay. And I'll come right out and say that. That's a controversial thing to say, but I don't support the troops. Okay. You know, I'm not one of those types that says, "Oh, well, no, I don't don't support the I don't support the war, but I still support the troops." <laughs> it's not like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, I mean on an individual level, uh-huh. I've developed these relationships in my life that I'm not willing to get rid of because that see things differently than I see them. Mm-hmm. But the thing is, when I look around, most people see things differently than you and I do mm-hmm. at this point. At this point, the idea that we need a state is the m- most prevalent by far. So if I'm going to go around disassociating myself from people that believe in the state, I'm not going to have that many people left in my life. Yeah, true. And it depends on what level you take that to as well. Because most of the people in my life, they don't really care for the state. And they sure would be happy without it. But they don't don't have the time to put, they haven't put all the time that you and I have into studying all these ways that it could work. Mm -hmm. We've put a lot of time reading and, you know, learning, listening to lectures, whatever we do, you know, getting on Mises.org and soaking up in information that a lot of people, that, that if they miss that, if, especially if they were before the internet, our grandparents, how are they going to know about all this stuff, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, obviously, obviously, a lot of it comes just from common sense and observing the world over time. And so a lot, that's why a lot of people have anti-government leanings, but they, they're still ingrained that we need a state, even if it's a small one, you know? Yeah, yeah, it's true. And, I, and, and that's one of the reasons why I really think that the internet um, is going to hasten the um, deletion of the state and just make it just irrelevant and obsolete. Because, you know, how can such a dinosaur institution like, like government which which survives only on propaganda and you know dogma and ritual and human sacrifice and theft and coercion how can that com- actually compete with the you know the the lightning fast speed and communication of the internet where you know we're we're like bred to hate foreign people because of nationalism and you you know you're bred to go over and hate them and and cheer for their demise but you can Skype with them like <laughs> for free. <laughs> and it's awesome. It's awesome. That's happening. I saw this thing on Facebook the other day. It was like this little video. Um, and it was this, it was this guy. I don't think he was a voluntarist or anything. I think he was just anti bombing and killing people. Um, mm-hmm. or pro peace or however you want to put that. But he did this video. He did this experiment where he, he friend requested like 20 Iranians or something like that. And, just did this video clip of how, look, oh, what do you know? They're not savages out to kill us. They're actually normal people that post, they have humor and, you know, they have relationships and love people and, you know. And so I, I thought it was a pretty cool video. And that, that is, that's a very true point that you made that, you know, with the internet, that stuff is, that stuff's going away. Because we can look around, we can actually see, hey, that's actually, no, that's not the case. And there's more information out there, too. There's more we can that I looked up when I was when I was re- researching when I was still in Afghanistan, all the, the historical stuff, the, the stuff that happened in that region. Uh, how would I have been able to do that without the internet? I would have been there. Like I would've I would have known. <laughs> so it's definitely a, a an important tool. Yeah, and that's exactly what it is, a tool. And, and and it's kind of funny that people, you know, they um, they yell at other people, you know, don't believe everything that you read on the Internet. <laughs> and so and so when they criticize the Internet, in my mind, like I'm, I'm thinking, what are they actually saying? Are they saying that it's better if we have less resources and less options to choose from and less information available? Like, is that better for people? <laughs> like, well, it's, it's, it's misleading because that's a correct statement. But they're just using it. In. You no. shouldn't believe everything you read on the internet. No, but you, if you're using that to discredit something that somebody found on the internet, that doesn't make any sense because there's lots of good resources on the internet that are truthful. 
Yeah, like like there's exactly, you know, using, you know, having the internet at your disposal is not a substitution for critical thinking and using your brain <laughs> to distinguish, you know, what you think is correct and not, right? Um because I mean, even without the internet, you know, you, you have people around you that have all different types of opinions. Are you going to believe everybody that you <laughs> that you meet? Right? Of course not, right? <laughs> so the the internet just magnifies that um availability of information and it, that's awesome you know it's like it's like the free market of information you know the the um the people that uh have really good quality products and blogs and websites are going to be you know attract a lot of followers and you know youtube channels that are really popular is going to you know you got to it's not a substitution for thinking <laughs> that's what i'm saying <laughs> oh. so um so yeah i kind of uh kind of laugh at that but um but but let, let me let me uh, change topics a little bit. Um, so you you are uh, a Christian and an anarchist, right? Yes. So um, I want I wanted to ask you something that a lot of people have asked me, and I, I wasn't really sure how to explain it because you know I'm not a Christian, so I can't really speak from that. But some people say you know anarchism is the um, the abolition of the belief in authorities, the ab abolition of the state. And the state is fundamentally rooted in the belief in authority, you know that that some higher um, entity has authority over your life, right? And in statism, that would be the government and everybody who represents government, politicians, bureaucrats, president, vice president, you know, everybody um, that they have, you know, superhuman power over our lives, and and they are given that power because we believe them to have power. That's the only reason they have power, because of course we outnumber them like enormously yet people still forfeit their money on tax day because uh they think that it's right and they think that the irs has enough agents to come after everyone who doesn't pay when in fact they don't <laughs> so um so so yeah so so um you know people say about the belief in authority and they say well what about christians you know if they, how can you be a christian and be an anarchist if you don't believe in authority yet you proclaim god as your authority how do you how would you respond to that well, it's like we were talking about before the show. Um, there's there's distinctions to be made in definitions, and how we define the terms that we use. Um, like I was saying, I'm not particularly connected to any type of label. <laughs> I don't really, I don't really care about the label so much. I'll call myself an anarchist. I'll call myself a voluntarist. I'll call myself a libertarian. I'll call myself just just a guy that wants to be left alone you know <laughs> so <laughs> nice i like that <laughs> but as i was saying earlier you know there's a important distinction i think that needs to be made between anarchists and voluntarists um a lot of people use that those synonymously um but i think you know an anarchist is someone that believes in no rulers um while a voluntarist is someone who believes that all interaction between human beings should be voluntary so i believe that you could have an anarchist that still aggresses on other people or supports aggression on other people that just doesn't believe in a state or doesn't believe in rulers. Um, basically, all voluntarists have to be anarchists, but not all anarchists have to be voluntarists, per se. Um, and with that, you know, goes into the definition of anarchism. Uh, anarchy, like I said, means no rulers from the Greek root. Uh, that's the basic definition of it, but people have gone all sorts of different ways with it. There are anarchists that, like you said, believe in no authority whatsoever. Um, and those anarchists, I, I would assume, sometimes would be more probable to be those that aren't voluntarists. Um, you and I, we, I, I don't know if you actually call yourself an anarcho-capitalist, but I know you have anarcho cat you believe in capitalism. Correct. Oh yeah. Okay. Definitely. So, as capital people that believe that capitalism is a, a fair system, economic system is the only correct economic system, free economic system. Maybe that's not true, but it we believe in capitalism. So, under capitalism, I can have a job and I can have a boss, as I do now. I have a boss. So he's my, technically my master. He owns me in that, that time period. I'm selling my labor to him. I'm selling myself to him. He is my authority figure. Okay, but that 
we're capitalists, right? A person can do that. A person can indenture himself to another person for wages or whatever the case may be. Uh, the same goes for any other kind of authority that's not a, a forceful authority, uh, whether it be going to a to a church authority, uh, somebody somebody that you just look up to, your your grandfather, that's an authority of the family, you know. So, I, being an anarchist, I, I don't believe in no authority. Um, I believe in no forced authority, um, and God certainly doesn't force us to do his will. Um, so I, for me, that's not a problem at all. And uh, yeah, there, there are definitely those, that, that branch of anarchists that say no authority whatsoever. But those, uh, the ones that I've encountered anywhere are usually also the ones that say no authority means no bosses at work and it means no, no teachers and no, you know. So, I mean, really that, that doesn't seem very practical to me. I mean, if that's how you want to live, like, fine, I'm not going to mess with that. But, you know, I, I kind of like having a boss telling me what to do, and I kind of like having people to seek advice from and things like that. Yeah, it seems that would be more um, the anarcho-communist or anarcho-syndicalist that, that, you know, believe in the um, worker-owned businesses, right, that the... At the there's no, there's really no hierarchy. There's just, you know, the right. worker and the worker owns a share of the business and the shares and the profits and can help make the decisions on the business. But and uh, that's very cool. That that is that is cool too. That's that's something that you know, in a free world, you have the right to do that. You have the right to. And for some businesses, that would work great. And people are actually doing similar things now. I don't, I don't know if you've ever caught uh, Mitchell Connor Wechek's uh, uh, show on Voluntary Virtues Network, the Adorable Anarchist. Um, I haven't seen any of his recent ones. Oh, no. That a few times, and I think there's a, there's another show on Voluntary Virtues that brings up a it's like a software company or a gaming company that kind of operates like that. So I'm I'm definitely not one of one of those people that's like oh no capitalism has to be has to be hierarchy has to be this one way you know no man I, anarchy do your thing mm -hmm. see what works if it doesn't work it doesn't work if it does work it does work mm -hmm. you know exactly that's what it's all about. Exactly. Trial and error. Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah. I mean, I have no, I have no problem myself with, you know, Christian anarchists or anarcho communists or, you know, what they call anarcho primitivists or anar you know, there's all so many different kinds. I don't really have a. As long problem. as there's no force. As long as they don't try to subjugate others or force them, force other people to you know, believe what they believe, right? If they can, they can, they're free to choose. Um, whatever type of living and arrangement they want to they want to live in right um and and, and the beautiful thing about anarcho capitalism is that you know we you know society can be anarcho capitalistic with small you know let's say anarcho communistic com communes or anarcho primitivist communes or whatever but you cannot have an anarcho communist society and anarcho capitalist uh you know small society inside of it because <laughs> because the anarcho communist is it's all about sharing and all this kind of stuff. So how can you really tolerate, you know, if uh, an anarcho-capitalist society inside that? Because it, there's a little more force required with that, you know. Like, what if somebody doesn't want to share? What if somebody wants to keep keep their profits, right? What if somebody? Well, that's where the problem comes along. But if people want to live in a live in a commune, yeah, that's great. And actually, you know, I would, you know, I would actually like to live in a situation where I live in a small village of people that I love and care about and we all, you know, have things common and take care of each other's needs, I think that would be great. Mm -hmm. You know, not necessarily just divvy up all our goods and do it in a systematic type of way, but I mean in a way that's just you're loving your neighbor and taking care of their needs and not putting your needs before their needs. I think that's great. Yeah. You know. But it's when you when you try to force other people to do that, that then it's a problem. Yeah. Then you're doing what the state does. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You're creating another state. Um, so I, I wanted to clarify a little bit. So talking about authority, what I what I meant, yeah, maybe we should have clarified definitions because when I mention when I say the word authority, what I'm talking about is um, you know an entity that claims the right, the moral right to rule, right? So it's not the it's not this is the would be the Larkin Rose definition, which I really I like a lot. You know, it's not the ability to rule, 
it's the moral right rule, right? So like like a mafia comes into town and they have force, you know, thugs, and they can rule the people in the town, right? But the people don't consider the mafia a legitimate authority figure. They consider them as the mafia, you know, and they don't call their commands laws. They just call them threats of punishment and commands, right? So when an authority figure has legi legitimacy, um, that's when you call it government because people actually believe that laws are legitimate and right and good, right? So, you know, and without that belief in legitimacy, they would just be commands and threats of violence, threats of punishment, you know, and taxation wouldn't be called taxation, it'd just be called extortion, right? Without legitimacy. So, yeah, so that's what I was meaning when I say authority. But, but yeah, I completely agree with you when you say, you know, you know, you can choose to have an authority figure if you want. Like, you choose God or you choose your grandfather, you choose, you know, your pastor or whatever. You know, you're choosing an authority figure, right? That's a voluntary choice. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So so that's basically, um, you know, when I talk about authority and the belief in authority. Um, and, and also hierarchy. Like, you're right. Like, like, you're, uh, like you said, um, um, you know, hierarchy itself is not evil. Like, like you said, when you, have, when you work for somebody, there's a hierarchy, right? Like, you're the worker and you have your boss, right? You have your manager and then the boss and the CEO. And... And I think that's wonderful because, you know, you know, maybe maybe a worker-owned uh, company can can work for some time, but I think for the most part it, it doesn't because people, like I don't I don't know what it's like to run a business, you know that my, you know all the decisions my boss has to make. Like I don't have that experience. Or let's say like the, let's say a, a minimum wage worker at McDonald's, you know, wants to make the decisions that the CEO is making. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, what would happen to that this the McDonald's franchise? <laughs> you would collapse. Like, w what kind of experience or in, or expertise or knowledge do they have of making those kinds of decisions? You, you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, I imagine I imagine those type of those type of businesses that would be operated like that would either be small businesses or would be businesses that are kind of under a system of just a bunch of individual contractors working together yeah. and under the same kind of company name or something that they just all know their stuff and know what they got to do yeah. you know i i don't know like i said you know I, that's not that's not for me to determine that's for the market to determine that's for their ability to determine but I, i'm sure that it could work in some some circumstances yeah I'm yeah sure that it does yeah, true, true. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I don't see it working in a large, <laughs> in a large situation either. I don't, I don't, Walmart's not going to operate like that. I can tell <laughs> no, you that. right. <laughs> exactly. Um, the person checking my, checking my groceries out. <laughs> like, like, do you want them making the the big decisions? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, so. I mean, I don't really care. They might, they might sell me stuff for pretty cheap. I don't know. <laughs> like, I, I remember reading a, a comment this guy made under a video about this, and he was saying, you know. The the guy the the guy the mouth breather, <laughs> this is what he said. The mouth breather who's who's earning minimum wage, standing still for seven hours pushing buttons, does not have the knowledge of a CEO. <laughs> and I'm like, wow, that's scathing. But okay, <laughs> I get your point. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I mean, we've all been there, right? We've all had, you know, when you're younger, you you have no experience, and so you rely on those those very um you know uh, low paying jobs right to gain experience in the in the in the in the marketplace right to to you know climb the ladder right so That's so um um so yeah so those 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 jobs are completely necessary but um <laughs> it's kind of, it's kind of funny and and, and you know th talking about McDonald's I don't know if you do you know anybody working at McDonald's because I uh, I like to talk to some people who are who are working in these quote unquote evil uh, companies because you know I like to ask them like do you feel like you're getting exploited like do you feel like a slave and and one of them was this Hispanic woman and she was like no I love it there because she's like they treat me so well and, and, and she doesn't speak much English right so it's really awesome for those people you know like immigrants from Mexico South America you know they love it because McDonald's is just happy to 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 hire them, and they you know they learn on the job, they learn English, they they learn different skills. So, do you? Yeah, look at, I know lots. Of, I know lots of people that work those kind of jobs. I know you know, I've I've worked you know not McDonald's. I've worked for Pizza Hut, you know, and, and places like that. And I, yeah, I know people that 
and no, most people, most people don't. Most, most rational people aren't like that. It's the people that feel like they're entitled mm. to something without earning it. Mm. But the people that have that kind of irrational mindset that they, oh, I should, I should just make fifteen dollars an hour because you know. But if you're not, if you're not producing at least fifteen dollars an hour, how are you going to make fifteen dollars an hour? It's a simple common sense would dictate that you should not be making fifteen dollars an hour if you're not producing fifteen dollars an hour. Like take away the the company and everything and just pretend it's just you and this is your business by yourself. If you're not producing fifteen dollars an hour, how are you going to make fifteen dollars an hour? Yeah. <laughs> it, you can't. You're going to have to rob other people or something. I don't know. Have, have... Uh-huh. <laughs> well, it's okay. No, it's okay because if they if they write on a piece of paper and make it law, it it over it supersedes, you know, economic reality, right? It supersedes mathematical reality. <laughs> but but there is another thing. There is another thing that I have to bring up in regards to that. It's it's not just that people feel entitled. It's that the situation right now. If if you're making what, what's minimum wage right at seven seventy five, something like that, yeah, seven seventy five an hour. Mm-hmm. I mean, seven seventy five an hour doesn't get you nothing right now. Man, seven. I I make more than I make a considerable amount more than that. Not a whole lot more, <laughs> but a considerable <laughs> amount more than that. Uh-huh. And I, I, I'm scraping, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So I imagine what it's like for somebody working seven seventy five an hour. Maybe they got kids. Maybe they got, you know. So, I, I, we. First of all, when you're so busy, maybe you got two jobs that pay minimum wage, and you got kids, and you're in this situation. You don't really have time to think through the economics or something. You just, oh well, that'd be good for me. Yeah, oh yeah, I would love to make. Twelve dollars now instead of seven seventy five. That would be great, you know. So a, bit, a lot of people, you know, I think it's, it's that kind of responsive. Of yeah, I I work hard. I deserve more money. <laughs> well, you know, yeah, you work hard and you deserve you deserve something out of that work. And it's it's sad that you don't produce more. Like if people get stuck in a rut, you know. If you get if you get stuck in a rut where you're just working a dead end job. And not not going anywhere, not <laughs> you. You can't beat economics, you know. Mm. You you can't beat economics. I mean, f- f- sort of, kind of, you can with the state's help, you know. <laughs> but in the end, you're not going to. You're just going to end up losing your job. Yep, exactly. And uh, and another thing I like to point out when I'm talking about minimum wage, I, I love talking about minimum wage with people because it's such an emotional topic, and also it's a great way to explain economics. Um, to people, um, which most people don't really, uh, they, they haven't thought about yet. But um, you know, like you said, you said you said, how can people survive on seven seventy five an hour, right? Well, I go even further than that. I say, what's the harm? So, so basically, those people are saying, you know, this is exploitation. That that's that's like slave wages. That's just horrible. I'm like, you know what? What if a guy who's you know has absolutely no skills whatsoever maybe he's even homeless and just you know just down in the dumps what if he's willing to work a job for five dollars an hour what do you think about that (laughs) because you know that gets people thinking like no that would be horrible i'm like well, that's better than what he was doing. Before. He didn't have it before. He, he wasn't. He was he were earning zero an hour. So now he's earning five an hour. Isn't that an improvement? And why? Why should that be illegal? Like, is anybody getting hurt by that transaction? Is anybody being forced to do anything against their will by that transaction? Right? <laughs> it's all voluntary. So, um, so really, it doesn't really matter what they're being paid. The whole point is. Is it a voluntary transaction? And if it is, it could be worth earning a dollar an hour, two dollars an hour. You know, if it's a volunteer, if the guy actually comes and is like, yeah, I want to earn a dollar an hour, it's better. It's an upgrade from where I was. Then, I mean, I don't have a problem with that, you know. But um, um, and in, in, a, in, a, in a voluntary society, you know, that would be that we wouldn't see, we wouldn't see as much of a problem with that. We wouldn't see a problem with that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, but it, it wouldn't be as big of an issue. Because people wouldn't be getting screwed as bad. There wouldn't be this big problem with fiat currency and inflation and people 
it, people are just in a tight spot. Mm-hmm. People get stuck in a spot and they're just there, <laughs> you know. And you can't, you know, you, you can't dig yourself out. But, but in a voluntary society, that that whole operation will move a lot, a lot smoother. And, and uh, man, I really fell off my train of thought there. I apologize. Yeah, but, that's right. No, no, problem. <laughs> no, no problem. No problem. Yeah, yeah. The uh, and, I, and I think not having a third of your paycheck stolen will also help as well, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Like, man, I just, I just paid my taxes. Yeah. No, 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 no. Correction. I, I still do that. Cor- correction. You don't pay your taxes. They take your taxes, right? This that, oh, yeah, they just took my taxes. <laughs> but I, I, no, no, actually, that's not true because I paid them. I didn't make them come take them. I could make them come take them. You could. I've thought about it. I've thought about it. You know, I think about not paying my taxes all the time. But for now, I still do because I want to not be in jail. I don't like jail very much. Yeah, sucks. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't want to do that. No, nope, that wouldn't be nice. But yeah, I just, I just, I just did that, and it was a, a good chunk of change. So <laughs> it's all right though. It went, it, it went for roads and bridges. You know, stuff that you appreciate, right? You know, so <laughs> no, of course yeah, not. Infrastructure, yeah, it definitely went to infrastructure because this is 1930. <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of funny when people people really think that um, that taxes actually go to fund those things, and I'm like, actually, the majority of taxes goes first of all, income tax I think goes towards just paying the interest on the national debt, which is just like fictional to begin with, and then the rest of it, like like sixty percent of the annual budget goes towards military spending, right? So you gotta support the troops, man. You gotta, <laughs> you gotta support the troops. You gotta support the troops. <laughs> What are you gonna do without the troops? So, so um, you know, if you're happy with drone drone bombings, invasions, and occupations, and you know, and uh, genocide, then that then, then that's your thing. You know, <laughs> be happy to you know be happy to pay your taxes. But if not, then you have to understand you know the philosophy behind it and start to speak out because I think uh, things won't change otherwise. You know, um, like uh, like like you know people who work. Uh, you know, work in these um, big companies that are like special interest groups, like, um, you know, like uh, the big banks, you know, JP Morgan Chase, Bank of America, or Wells Fargo, or, you know, big pharmaceutical companies, you know, they're like, you're basically like supporting the state in a way, you know, you're not necessarily a government agent, but you're supporting the state in a way. And, and it kind of seems to me similar to people who worked in, um, you know, in Nazi Germany, let's say as an accountant. You know, you you work for the for the uh, you know for the for the SS soldiers or the uh, or the Nazi party as their accountant. You're like, you know, I'm just I'm just I'm just doing my job. You know, this is a paycheck. I gotta feed my family. My kids are hungry. How am I gonna put my kids, you know, through a good school without <laughs> this money, right? And and that's that's the problem that we have to overcome is uh, you know people's how do you, how do you say that is it it's a normalcy bias, you know people people want to want to you know they don't want to stir the waters right they don't want to um they don't want to stand up because it's always the the nail that stands out that gets that gets hammered in right <laughs> uh well i think that's i think that's part of it but I, I think another part of it is people just they haven't they haven't got they haven't put the thought in they haven't had the time they're they're, they're busy they're, their mind's busy with other things and they haven't just they haven't got there I don't know if that's how it was for you, but for me it was, you know, I, I reached this point and where I realized that oh wait, the state is, is not legitimate. I'll you know, I there I had to I had to reach this point where that kind of just came crashing down on me, mm-hmm. you know. So yeah, I got got to keep telling the truth about it and keep you know putting those thoughts in people's minds, planting those seeds, you know. Mm-hmm. And and more and more of them will quit their jobs, you know. Yeah, that's indeed. <laughs> but just gotta get to that point. Yeah, indeed. The first thing you know, you we, we we really don't have much choice about taxes, but we do. What we do have choice is actually believing the lies and the propaganda, and actually supporting it by working in government. You know, and I say working quotation marks working because I don't really consider that work because it's not. Those jobs are not created out of not productive. Uh, they're not created out of market demand. They're created out of coercion, right? So they're not real <laughs> productive jobs, like as you yeah. said. Um, but um, but I don't want to keep you any longer, Caleb. Um, 
thank you very much for the conversation. Um, so, so before we go, is there anything that you want to tell my listeners? Um, you know, a message to them from uh, from your experience studying what you studied. I, I, would, I do want to give a quick shout out because uh, we brought up earlier. Uh, we were talking about uh, being, being a Christian in relation to being an anarchist. Um, there's there's a, a group on Facebook called Christian Market Anarchists. It's a pretty cool group. There's lots of us out there. There's lots of people that believe in the Christ that also are anarchists. Um, just like there's lots of people that believe in capitalism that are anarchists. Uh, you know, just we're still anarchists, <laughs> yeah. and we're out there. We're yeah, out there. I have no problem with people, you know, having their own religions, having their own belief systems. Um, you know, to me, um, as long as uh, you know you understand voluntarism and you know the freedom philosophy and non-aggression principles, self-ownership, property rights. Um, you know, co- coercion is not consent. Taxation is theft. Um, you know, <laughs> things like that that the state is illegitimate, that's good enough for me. Um, beyond that, you know, I have no problem with people because imagine, it's like, I'm always, I always think, like, what if the world was like me, like exactly like me? Like, how boring of a world would that be? <laughs> and that's what I think when people have a problem with, you know, this sect of anarchy or that sect of anarchy is like you want everyone to believe exactly what you know it's like you have a problem because he's a christian anarchist or you have a problem because he's an anarcho commie you have a problem because he's you know whatever but you know as long as we have the core mission i think it's fine it's, it's like there's there is no problem right yeah and that, that that's why i just wanted to pull that out and kind of put a little emphasis on it because there is there is a stigma um in at in an anarchist movement or an anarchist community or whatever you want to call it of, of uh, kind of an anti-theist stigma. There's a lot of, there's a lot of that. There's a lot of um, disregard for God. Um, and a lot of people that, that mock God. Um, but on the other hand, there, there is a lot of us that are Christians. All right. Well said. Thank you very much, Caleb, for the conversation. I appreciate it. Um, so this is um, Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network and the, U- the Conscious Resistance YouTube channel and uh, Seeds of Liberty podcast. You can find that on uh, theseedsofliberty.com. Um, and uh, I'm also on iTunes and Stitcher. So if you want to catch these podcasts there, you can uh, download the uh, or you can subscribe to the RSS feed through my Peace Fanaticism website or through the seeds of liberty.com. So thank you very much. Uh, wonderful conversation. So um, I hope everyone has a wonderful day. Take care.